Hello, Jeff Zwerink here again with Give and Take, where we explore the latest scientific issues to help you be confident in sharing the gospel. And today we're joined by a special guest, Ted Cable, and we're going to address a common charge against Christianity that science and faith are in conflict, and all we have to do is look at the Galileo affair to see how Christianity is holding back science. Ted, good to have you here on the set today. Thanks for having me. So this is just really a common charge that... Uh, Christianity and science are in conflict, that uh, Galileo was advancing the cause of science and Christianity was holding science down. And, uh, you know, I know you studied that in your position at uh, South Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, looked at philosophy of religion or not. So what are your thoughts? How do we deal with this Galileo mm -hmm. conflict? Yeah, the, the interesting thing about Galileo is that he had more to say about the relationship of the Bible and science um, than perhaps the theologians of his day did. Hmm. And everybody involved in the conflict were Christians and believed in the Bible. And uh, we may not know how committed they were in their personal lives, but what we know from their public lives and their writings is they all believed that they were uh, interested in trying to uphold the truth of both the Bible and science and their so, best ways of thinking. So this this whole dis discussion then really isn't about science and Christianity or Galileo the science being held down by Christianity it is. It's, it's a discussion of how do science and Christianity relate, which we're still having today in a very real sense. Absolutely. In fact, there's a, a grand cultural myth we may talk about later, but it is that science and theology are in perpetual warfare. The truth mm -hmm. is there have been potential conflicts from their, the very beginning, which is why the Galileo Affair is the most famous. It happens with the very first major science theology mm -hmm. conflict. Science is dated, modern science, from the publication of Copernicus on the Revolutions, that, that book in 1543 which launches this new way of thinking about the, uh, the Earth mm -hmm. is no longer the center of the solar system or the universe. And when Galileo uh, endorsed the Copernican worldview, or view of the universe literally, the, um, the, the Catholic Church at the time was troubled in response to the Protestant Reformation, and it didn't want him taking on interpretation on his own. The truth be known though, he wrote at the time his own understanding of the way these sorts of things should be worked out. And I have looked at the way Christians have struggled with these issues through the centuries, and I was shocked. I didn't understand that he actually had the right proposal from the beginning. You know, that's a fascinating thing. One, two things there. One, that um, this isn't new that there seems to be this tension at times between science and Christianity. Yeah. Uh, and two, that there have been good principles set forth on how Christians have dealt with this. And I know you deal with this in a book, uh, Controversy of the Ages. Can you kind of spell out what are those principles of how Christians should approach these science-faith conflicts, if you will? Right. It's interesting when I actually looked rather than just sort of the assumption that I hold, which is that, okay, the Bible is is right, and I don't want science telling me how to interpret my Bible. I just knew that that isn't exactly the way it's always worked. Hmm. And whether it happened to be whether the earth or the sun is the center of our solar system or whether or not dinosaurs really existed when people first discovered them, it shocked the idea of these fossils in stone. Um, whether or not plate tectonics or the expansion of the universe and any number of other ideas, there was an immediate worry about them. Do these conflict mm -hmm. with the Bible? And I call these on marriage terms um, the conservatism principle from business where you want to create a conservative financial statement. You don't overstate mm -hmm. your assets and you don't understate, uh, you, you don't understate your liabilities. Well, so in this principle that I discovered all Christians, whether young earth, old earth, whatever, practice this through the centuries. At first, the response is the two can never wed. There's the marriage idea. Mm -hmm. They can't get along, so we're not going to consider it. But over time... If so it, it does really look like a conflict. It looks like start. a conflict right. in many instances. Mm -hmm. how, how are we going to... We're dinosaurs. Are you kidding me? They were not in the Bible, right. so they must not exist. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, over time, the evidence mounts, and people begin to say, maybe there's something here. What should we think about it? I call that the second phase, where they begin to court. Mm -hmm. They consider, is there any aspect of that scientific theory that's possibly true? Right. And finally, over time, they realized they had the Bible 
Uh, they marry, the two marry, but they marry on certain terms, and that's where so, Galileo so, comes in. So this is presuming that the evidence continues to grow and show that dinosaurs really do exist, or exactly. that hominids actually interbred with, yes. or Neanderthals interbred with humanity. Exactly. Okay, all right. They begin to say, you know what, we have to put these two together in some way because the evidence of, of both is, we know the Bible's true, but how do we do with this new evidence? And they marry, but on certain terms. And that's where Galileo got it right from the start. Well, and it seems like that idea of them marrying is kind of predicated on a couple of assumptions there. That, yep. I mean, it's not just saying, oh, the science rules, we got to figure out how to reinterpret the, the Bible, is it? That's exactly right. Galileo proposed in a couple of famous letters he wrote at the time, First of all, we assume the Bible is inerrant. This was his language. The Bible doesn't have any mistakes because God wrote it. But he said our second assumption is the Bible is not in conflict with the creation precisely because God wrote the book of creation. Hmm. So those two assumptions then gave him the way to have two steps or applications of those principles to potential science theology conflicts. He says if in the first place, if the science is proved not proven, then retain your traditional mm -hmm. interpretations. But if the science is proven, and there's where the devil's in the details, but he says if it's proven, then it shows you misinterpreted the Bible. And what I've seen is through the centuries, this is exactly what conservative Bible-believing Christians have done. They've cautiously looked at this and applied this Galileo principle or proposal mm -hmm. And uh, not always do we agree or Christians agree when and how to do this application. And in the case of evolution, some aspects of Darwin's theory we're still pushing back against, like mm -hmm. universal common descent, much less evolutionary naturalism. But in the sense of are there speciation events and whatever, the, many Christians, including young earth Christians, will accept that. So. It's not a law that says you have to do it this way. It's not written in the Bible, but it is the way that Christians have actually done this for centuries now. You know, it really is a remarkable thing to think that over the last centuries, four, five, six centuries, Christians have seen what appears to be conflicts and often dating to Galileo being the most prominent example of that. But as Christians have investigated the evidence and seen the evidence grow, they've recognized that the scriptures and creation are going to agree when we properly interpret them because ultimately God is the author of both. And that gives us a freedom to enter into those mm. controversial discussions, to evaluate what's going on, often to use the science as a bridge so that we can engage with those deeper matters. What does the gospel have to say about who God is and how do we relate to him? So let's be excited and use this great opportunity to go out and spread the gospel.